What made the Great War different from any before it was that it affected everyone, soldier and civilian alike. From 1914, the government had taken control of key industries, iron, steel, transport. They had changed the licensing laws to keep workers out of the pubs. They even changed the clocks, introducing British summertime to save daylight. In 1916, Lloyd George replaced Asquith as head of a coalition government. Faced with a falling number of recruits, he introduced conscription, the compulsory enlistment, first of single men, then married men, into the army. In this struggle to keep people behind the war, press photographers were to play a crucial part. There's a story here that doesn't do much credit to my profession. It's on the front page of the mirror, and it's about conscientious objectors. They were people who, for whatever reason, political, religious, refused to fight. As far as the newspapers were concerned, these conchies were at best cowards, at worst traitors. And this photo spread shows our brave photographer, here he is, taking secret paparazzi snaps of conchies under guard at a government facility in Dartmoor. It says here, apparently, they are a truculent crowd, in spite of their pacifist professions, and threatened our photographer with sticks and stones. I love this, look, the conscientious objector often has long hair. Conscientious objectors suffered the ignominy of being outsiders at a time of national togetherness, because this was a conflict in which everyone was meant to play their part. As food shortages increased, rationing was eventually introduced. You tightened your belt for the cause. Even the king and queen had ration cards. Meanwhile, the Zeppelins, enemy airships, brought the sensation of direct attack to British cities and one and a half thousand people lost their lives. The deaths proved a useful source of unity, bringing people together in anti-German outrage, stiffening resolve. But it was in the workplace this mood of common purpose was felt most acutely. As skilled working men joined the army in their hundreds of thousands, their places in industry had to be filled, either by unskilled men or increasingly by women. For the suffragette cause, it was to prove an unexpected blessing. These are the remains of the old Woolwich Arsenal, one of many factories in Britain used in the First World War for the production of munitions, of shells and guns and heavy artillery. And it was here that Horace Nichols took some of his most famous photographs. Nichols was too old to fight, but in June 1917, he was appointed official photographer for the home front. And they're extraordinary photographs. They're simple, they're thorough, they're brilliant. By far the best record of women workers in the First World War. From the moment war was declared, leaders of both the suffragists and most of the suffragettes had called for women to rally round the flag. As the suffragist Millicent Force had put it, Women, your country needs you. Let us show ourselves worthy of citizenship, whether our claim to it be recognized or not. By the end of the war, about a million more women were at work than in 1914. Not just working class women, for whom work was nothing new. Women from all social classes helped the war effort as colliers, as porters, as drivers, as laborers in the fields and in the factories. Horace Nichols recorded their achievements. Again, what I love best in Nichols' work is his honesty. These are women too tired to strike a pose. He doesn't even get them to smile but you can sense his respect for their labor. By 1918, women had shown they weren't the weaker sex. Alongside men, they'd helped win this war, overturning in the process society's views of men and women's roles. 
And so, bowing to the inevitable, in February 1918, Parliament passed the Representation of the People Act, granting women over 30 the vote, the first vital step in the complete outlawing of sex discrimination in British law. On the 11th of November, 1918, the guns on the Western Front fell silent for the last time. As one British colonel later recalled, The armistice was timed to begin at 11 o'clock, and to the minute there came a great cheering from the German lines, and the village church bells rang. But on our side, there were only a few shots. The match was over. It had been a damn bad game. Back home, people greeted the German surrender with scenes of celebration. The picture press showed the crowds thronging Trafalgar Square. But in the Nichols household, as elsewhere, the celebrations were mixed with sadness. Horace Nichols' eldest son had died in this, what Lloyd George called, the cruelest and most terrible war that has ever scourged mankind. For Britain and the British Empire, the casualties ran to almost a million. And in the aftermath, the camera, in the hands of the Imperial War Graves Commission, had one more grisly task to fulfill. Photos were taken of thousands of graves to be sent to relatives back home. Britain emerged in 1919, victorious but weakened. The government promised jobs and housing, a land fit for heroes. But public spending was handcuffed by massive national debt, the cost of fighting the war. Many of those soldiers so keen to return to their old jobs found themselves on the unemployment dole. The women for whom in the war years there'd been no praise too high now found themselves told their place was back in the home. And now that the wartime ban on strikes had been lifted, Hosts of angry workers protested against the rising cost of living. In 1924, the rejection of the old order saw a Labour victory in Parliament for the first time. It was as if the war had exposed the myth of the Edwardian Golden Age. The image that now emerged showed Britain in hard reality, not to be glossed over as it had been before. In memory of his son, Horace Nichols transcribed the famous poem in Flanders Field into his family's photographic album. It read, We are the dead. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep 